Okay, it looks like we're recording. So everyone, uh, as you know, this is Gordon Einstein, your local friendly Dubai crypto attorney. I'm continuing my series of short, nice, friendly interviews with people who I like, who I add value, who are interesting, who are from Germany. Yes. Uh, and Holger Scher, I'm pronouncing your name correctly because you gave me a nice little mnemonic. That's right, yes. Welcome on the show. Thank you for making the time. I, I know you're a busy guy, so welcome. Thanks for having me. Of course. Um, so I met you at, uh, let's see, Ivan Rabinovich's venture or something breakfast. It was, I think it was the VNTR Capital yes. Investors Roundtable last year at that um, GTEx fair, wasn't it? I, I think it was a side event to that, but yes, I think you're right. It was a side event, exactly. It was a side event of this. Yep. Yeah. And, and so you struck me as an interesting guy. Uh, I honestly wanted to get to know you better, but just we've both been busy trying to schedule lunches and breakfasts and meetings. And finally, we decided to escalate and go all the way to an interview. So this is super. Um, let, let's give a super brief version of what you're doing now. And then we'll do the much longer version after we do your background. But what's the headline? What, what do you do for a living? What I do for a living, well, it's a couple of different things, actually. Um, it is corporate finance on the one side and it's transaction services on the other side, given the fact that I'm an educated lawyer and have been practicing law for well, now almost, more than 25 years already. So I'm, I'm actually younger than I, uh, uh, I look younger than I am, actually. So um, it's, it's corporate finance and transaction services, actually. That's in, in brief words. So we are basically doing private equity uh, transactions for the most part, leveraged buyout transactions, venture capital transactions for institutional investors that can be PE funds, venture capital funds, family offices, high potential individuals. And sometimes we are also on the other side, i.e. on the side of the company, um, helping uh, companies grow. Um, so I would describe it as corporate development. We do basically everything that helps company uh, companies grow, institution, uh, um, internationalize the companies, um, help the, them with their day-to-day -day business, but also get financing on board and so on and so forth. That is what we do. And, and you do that as a lawyer or as a fund or a service provider? I didn't quite catch that. As a, as a service provider, yes. So Saxon Global, my new firm, is not a fund. Um, it is a service provider working together with around about a thousand professionals in 21 jurisdictions all over the world right now. And I am a lawyer by education and I'm still lawyering sometimes. I still have my admission in, in Germany yes. uh, and I have my admission, uh, admission in New York City. Um, so that is that is basically what I do. That's great. And give me the name of this of the company again. Saxon Global Consulting. That's Got the it. name of my new firm. I, I founded it in uh, January last year, 23, after leaving Germany um, in December 2022. Which we're gonna get we're gonna get into more or less. Okay, so you're you're obviously from Germany, yes? Yes, that is correct. I'm, I was part? born and raised in Germany. Well, I'm from a, 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 a tiny little town where the river Lahn meets the river Rhine, uh, about 100 kilometers south of Cologne. Uh, Lahnstein, it is called. Okay. Um, and I've been living quite a while in, in Cologne, studied in Bonn, our former capital, prior to the reunification. And then I was a couple of years in the United States, as you can well tell from, from the accent. Um, so after I, I studied law in, um, in Bonn and finished it, I went to the United States, did my uh, master's in, in, in Boston. Uh, in Boston. Uh, I was in San Francisco about six months prior to that, mm -hmm. um, improving my English because at that time I hadn't spoken English for eight years actually. And um, then I went to Boston, uh, to Boston University, did the master's, and then I went to New York and took the bar exam and started working, basically. Yeah, interesting. Did, and did then I went to back Boston? to Germany. In... I went to Boston University School of Law. Yes. I, you know, you and, I, you and I were almost classmates. That's funny. Have we been? Yeah, I, I went to USC, been? but my, my alternative was Boston University. Ah, okay. Well, I did the master's at BU. 
and um, which is nice, you know, at the Charles River, you always it look across amazing. the river yeah, to I, MIT. It's gorgeous. <laughs> and, uh, I, I chose based on geography, not on quality of school, but you know, BU. That, that was that was the big choice, BU or USC, and that, just for just because my family is back in Los Angeles. And a couple yeah. other factors I did USC, but otherwise I would have been BU and BU was fantastic. I, I went to Brandeis undergrad, so I used to go to BU uh, all the time. So good for you. That's awesome. Uh, and then yeah. what, what led to you doing the bar exam in New York or joining the New York bar? Well, at that time I was, well, still young and juicy, you know, today I'm just end. Um, and it was not really decided whether I wanted to stay in the States for good uh, or not. And um, the idea, you know, at that time, it was not that common to have a double qualification in German law and in, in, in American law. And what I wanted to do, and that is what I knew at that time already, is doing international m &A. And um, it was clear to me that um, you have to have an admission in a common law jurisdiction in order to be able to do that as a lawyer properly, because um, the common law style of contracts is simply setting the benchmarks globally to do this type of job. And um, that was one of the reasons for me doing the bar exam in New York and then also start working there, basically. Um, I got hired at that time with Clifford Chance. That was right after the merger of Clifford Chance and Rogers and Wells in New York. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I went back to Germany in um, late 2000. Basically, and uh, for the first couple of years, I, I, I went on working with Clifford Chance at that time uh, before I then moved to other firms, big international firms like, like Denton's or Norton Rose Fulbright until I opened my own firm in 2018 uh, back in Germany. And when you were working for Clifford Chance in Germany, were you practicing a more German style law or were you bringing the common common law of mode to Germany? Well, that, that, that frankly depends a little bit on, on whom you are actually serving, you know? Yeah. If, you're, if you're doing a German transaction where there is no international angle attached to, you're pretty much do, doing m and in, in the German way, which basically means that contracts are a lot smaller than, than having a, a typical English or Anglo-American um, style SPA you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're having to, to negotiate. But since we also had a lot of transactions for, for big international private equity funds, you know, at that time, the chance has been has been working for CVC and uh, and 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 uh, E uh, three I and, and and all these type of funds. You of course do a lot of your work um, in these typical common law styles, actually, because yeah. that has become the standard for M and A in Germany in the meantime as well. Not just the M and A side of it, also the financing. You know, leveraged finance agreements today mostly follow um, uh, LMA standards, so London Market Association standards. So um, ultimately, when you when you look at the, the, the job I'm doing for the last 25 years, it's really predominantly being done in English, on, on, on English style templates and uh, working styles. Interesting. Now, you've, if I'm hearing correctly, your return to Europe was around 2000. So you, you got a solid 20, 25 years, I mean, obviously you have your current iteration, but you have a solid, say, 20 years of watching the European community and the, the European Union solidify and form its market. Is there a, I'm just interested in this as a lawyer, is, is there sort of a European style of contracting or is that too mm. ambitious of a description? I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't say so, because if you if you look at the European market, um, the continental European market pretty much has followed the the London market. You know, um, thing, things kind of swapped over from from New York to London and from London to the continent. So there is there is not a U European style or EU style um, uh, M and A market or uh, uh, templates or something like this. It's it's mostly London. So when you when you and, you know, given the fact that, that our head office with Clifford Chance was in London as well, 
well, it's kind of clear that whatever we did in Germany and whatever, um, let's say, the, the German attorneys uh, took over was kind of, of London style. And um, if, I, if I look at the European market in total these days, it really doesn't matter whether you buy a company in France, in Poland, in Italy, in Germany, in Austria, or in, in Sweden. They all, meanwhile, have more or less the same style of producing these type of, of company purchase agreements. And that's all being guided by what has been uh, developed end of the 90s, beginning of the 2000s uh, in, in America and in the UK. Do you think, we will get to how this all applies to your new home here in Dubai, but I, I just find this fascinating. Do, do you think... You're, you're, you're implying that the state of art went to a certain point and then it kind of stopped. Maybe it stopped because it was sufficient or maybe it just stopped because it stopped. Do, do, you see, do you see the state of the art evolving further or is just this just the way it's done and get used to it? There hasn't been that many changes over the last couple of years. I would say the market is pretty stable when it comes to the way it's being done in practice. Um, it, it evolves in the sense that fund structures change. Um, at the beginning, at least when you have been working in Germany, you also saw a lot of like domestic fund structures, like KG structured, limited partnership structured, um, um, based on German corporate law. Um, and then over the years, it has evolved in the sense that even um, uh, German GPs, i.e. the management teams being located in Germany, established international fund structures on the Indian Islands, um, in Guernsey, Luxembourg structures, etc., etc., etc. And um, the more you saw these structures, the more um, in practice the way of doing the business has adapted more and more to the English style, because. Yeah. Uh, you, you you have to have some some sort of harmonized procedures, you know, because otherwise you would have to explain each and every time everything all over again. And um, today it's it's really if you're if you're talking to to people who are or to colleagues to lawyers on the other side of the table who are in that business for many years, like I am, and who have sufficient deal experience there is a lot you don't need to explain anymore. It's kind of common sense now. This is how it looks like. This is how it's being dealt with. And um, that helps a lot. It speeds up the process. It it reduces cost on both ends of, of the table. Um, and it also ensures a certain standard of quality across uh, the European um Let's say prime firms. I would, I would, I would call it like this. Of course, it makes a difference if you, if you have um, a smaller, unexperienced firm on the other side of the table. But if you're dealing with, with firms like like uh, uh, like Dentons, Clifford Chance, Norton Rose, Freshfields, etc., so, uh, uh, link letters, then you typically can you 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 pretty much can be sure you have a certain. Um, a standard in terms of how it looks and feels and also in terms of quality. And that is important for the business. Okay, I, I didn't want to belabor it, but it, to me, it's interesting. And I, I admire your career and that, that was a good explanation. So at, at some point, I don't know which came first, you transitioned to Dubai or you transitioned out of law into a more service hands-on role. Do you want to talk about that phase of your career and what's been going on more recently? Well, you know, um, you know, I've, I've, I've been exciting practicing happened. as a, well, I don't know whether it's, it is it is it is exciting in the sense you know um, I turned fifty in in in, in uh, two thousand twenty two so I'm a pretty old guy, and when you turn fifty and when you have been practicing as a lawyer in the, in, in, in in corporate M and A for such a long time. Um, you have to think about what what are you want, going to do with the with the with the next like twenty to twenty five years, not yeah. just professionally, also also personally. And um, for us, you know, the kids have been old enough in order to uh, to go to boarding school. They both wanted that. 
uh, they wanted to go to England and that's what they did and mm -hmm. that's where they are. And um, so uh, the situation basically opened up for my wife and myself to, to make a change. And um, that, that change on a personal level was accompanied by clients asking me, why are you just selling legal services? Can't you do more? Uh, why, why don't you basically do the whole um, uh, sales or acquisition process um, and so on and so forth. And um, I've been involved in, well, actually, I have no idea, maybe 800 transactions in my life. So there's, wow. there's hardly an aspect in these type of MA transactions I'm not familiar with. And of course, I have also in the past already um, processed entire transactions like uh, like an m a advisor um even though as a german lawyer um, you're not really supposed to to um let's say collect um on the upside uh, of these transactions as you as you typically do in an, in an m a environment um and that was one of the reasons for me um changing horses and um uh, building a different type of firm and when when we look at my new firm which i'm which I then opened when, when I moved down here, um, January last year, um, Saxon Global is not a law firm. Saxon Global is basically a corporate development company. It's basically meant yeah. to, um, to put companies, entrepreneurs, funds, whoever uh, 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 seeks our services, to put them in a position to make the company better, to buy, sell, finance, restructure companies, and help them doing that by um, uh, by a large number of professionals, which we have technically integrated on a on a on a, on a, on a platform um, that enables us to have them on a very short leash when it comes to steering the work they're doing, when it uh, comes to cost control and so on and so forth, which of course in the advisory business is always a, a big topic you know you're getting a budget and uh, subsequently it's like 150 percent of that budget and the clients typically do not appreciate that we have developed means also a technical integration of all the people working with us that enables us to stick to the budgets to to streamline the work dramatically to make it faster and to make it better quality wise and um um, yeah, and part of that, um, uh, doing these transaction services is one pillar of what we do, and um, uh, the other pillar is doing um, typical um, M&A services or so corporate mm -hmm. finance services together with cooperation partners we have all over the world. And a third pillar that has just recently um, uh, come into play is uh, digitalization services. So um, we also have corporate... Um, um, professional service providers on board that help with um, everything that has to do with app development, Web3, blockchain, um, uh, technical due diligence and integration and all these type of things. And um, the interesting thing about that is that depending on the type of transaction, you know, if you do a carve-out transaction, for example, you're not just doing a legal and tax due diligence and a financial due diligence of that specific piece of enterprise you want to carve out. You also have to make sure that once it's being carved out, it can walk on a standalone basis. And for that, you need to do a technical due diligence. You might need to negotiate transition services uh, and so on and so forth. And um, since we had these type of transactions quite a lot over the last couple of years, uh, we decided that we also take the tech guys on board in order to be able to basically deliver these type of services out of one hand, like a 360 degree one shop. Um, um, you're, you're, I, I like how you're ambitious and you're responding to the market and using that as an opportunity to strategically grow is, is what I'm hearing. Well, it is actually, yes. It, it, on, on, on the one hand, it kind of expands my own or my firm's value creation chain, but on the other hand, it um, it gives the clients more flexibility. You know, many of the people or many of the clients I am working with mm. are really, really old clients of mine. Some even 18, 19 years, and wow. um, they have a very, very high loyalty. You know, you're not you're not typically working for a fund. What you're doing is you work for the team. Sometimes they they change funds. 
and then you change with them. So it is, um, and, and, and giving these teams more tools uh, at hand um, for the business they are doing and, and it, improving the services, um, that is very important if you want to stay in business for as long as I am already. So uh, it's kind of reinventing yourselves over the years. Um, that's what I did when I switched law firms in the past. Mm -hmm. And in particular, when I, when I opened my own firm in, in 2018, and that's of course what I've been doing even more now that I have um, Saxon Global down here, which has a more international focus than, than um, you, you just a law firm. The next question, which is, did Saxon go, is it is this focused Europe, the GCC, the world? I mean, is there a scope to it? Or is there a th way things tend to play out? Well, um, if you look at it from, from a regional perspective, it has a focus on North America and, uh, and Europe, definitely. Yeah. Um, GCC is growing. Um, that basically comes by chance, you know, since I'm now located here physically, you start building a network. Um, you cannot defend yourselves against it. So uh, contacts kind of come automatically over time. So we now already have the first assignments down here. We are currently selling a big EPC company um, uh, down here in the UAE, for example. And um, so I would say the focus is North America, Europe and, and, and Middle East. I'm not that much active in Asia, I have to admit. Um, but we can also service um let's say jurisdictions in asia when it when it should be necessary but that's not the focus in terms of how we or where we originate our business okay and, we, and would you say that the gcc m a it sounds like you're doing m a and management consulting and a lot would you, would you say that the gcc m a market is mature maturing what, it is oh that is comp it is, it is it's frankly completely different to the European or the American. Um, I think what is really important for people to understand is that um, the market down here works completely different. You know, um, European market sees a lot of SMEs, small and medium sized enterprises, yes. which are 50, 60, 70, maybe 100 years old, which now come into a state of development where they need a succession planning, where the owner might have decided, okay, well, he might not have kids or he doesn't uh, consider his kids to be the proper people to, to go on with the business. He wants to sell it or the family to sell it. So these type of um, um, succession transactions, which is kind of the core to private equity, if you're honest, um, that doesn't happen down here in GCC that much because businesses don't have the tendency to be that old. The one we are currently selling is one that is about 30 years old. The owner is about 70. He yeah. has two sons and um, they have decided we want to basically sell the company, maybe do a recap, stay stay on board as managers, but have a certain diversification of, of wealth also. Mm -hmm. But there are simply not that many types of businesses being that old and being um, in a stage of development where you could sell it. So if I look at the M&A market down here, it's more large cap M&A, you know, one, one uh, 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 whatever uh, Kuwait Petroleum Corporation buys one other multi-billion uh, 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 company. This type of M and A, which is kind of more strategic M and A, of course, mm -hmm. that is something that that takes place a lot here. But from the experience of the last like one and a half to two years, I have made in in GCC um, that typical SME mergers and acquisitions that is not that common down here and um from what i could figure out until now is that also the professional services firms being located down here or the partners in those firms haven't seen that many of these medium-sized deals simply for the no. reason they are not that many in the market you know if you're if you're a partner in an international law firm sitting in london and doing m a you, you have like 10 15 20 of these deals every year if you're down here you might have 
two or three. That is that is a bit the difference. At least that's how it feels, and that's what some of my colleagues, being in international firms down here, have have told me how how they feel it is. So they 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 sometimes have to basically um, get back to their colleagues in London in order to get some 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 sort of best practice advice and 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 up to date templates and that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. And that is interesting to see. Um, and that's a bit of my experience I've, I've made here the last couple of months. Interesting. And, and then w when you, was it, I mean, to the extent you feel comfortable talking about it, were you either A, leaving Germany or B, coming to Dubai? What, 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 were you being pushed or pulled? <laughs> Both. Both, actually. Um, I, I didn't see it. Or yeah, it's kind of, yeah. Uh, Ziehen und drücken, actually. Um, no, it's, it's, it's as, I, as I said, you know, becoming 50, you start thinking about what you're going to do with the rest of your life. And uh, or as, 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 as my brother just recently said, so what are you going to do with the remaining 25 years where you can still walk upright and have a bit of fun in your life? So um, frankly, you're, you're having a lot more fun down here than you have in Germany, at least in the current situation. I yes. think we don't need to discuss about that. And um, um, even though I don't want to talk bad about my home country or let's say about the European situation in total, but they have a hard time ahead of them. I've just recently been at a at an event uh, down here in Dubai where um, I, I think it's the one I'm referring to. Head, uh, that might well be, yeah. The head of I, I were talking about ABC. Exactly. And my, my, there my was friend, that's because this... I, I, I connected you with Raphael and said, invite Hope. Yes, 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 exactly. That's, that's the one I'm that's the one I'm talking about. And 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 one of the speakers, he said Europe is going to turn into the museum of the world. And that's exactly what we felt um for the last few years. And that was one of the reasons saying, okay, listen, um, I don't want to live in a museum. I want to be somewhere where the life is vibrant, where the business is evolving, where people have the drive to build something. And, you know, we came, we came, we came to Dubai um, like uh, the Virgin Maria to Jesus, kind of. Because when we, when we got in touch with Dubai, it was act originally just to do an investment. Um, buying a piece of real estate. Once you buy a piece of real estate, um, out of a sudden we had that golden visa for not just my wife and myself, but for the whole family. And once you have these opportunities to stay, um, you start thinking. And it's it's a process that 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 um, evolved over a, over almost a year until we then really decided. You know what? We do that. We have the we have the means. We have uh, a business idea on, on, on what we can and want to build down here. And um, the kids felt um, happy in boarding school in England. And so we said, okay, let's do that. And that's basically how we ended up here. And then making, of And he hit the ground running, apparently. Context. Oh, yes. The first year was, well, I would say decent. Um, the second year is going to be much better <laughs> and um yeah let's see where we end up but but it it um it turns out to have been the right decision from a business perspective it's really nice the clients like how we do it and what we do and um that uh, that expansion of value creation chain i've been talking to you about that is something i can clearly say that came into play dramatically and um, we have a lot of nice sales side um, mandates on the table right now in Europe, in the US, and also down here in GCC. And um, we'll see how they turn out. The market in general is, is complicated in Europe in particular. High interest rates, um, a private equity crunch in the sense that um, um, many funds have problems in fundraising. Um, Mm. Um, the high interest rates have put pressure on the prices. There is kind of a matchmaking process between buyers and sellers uh, in, in, in terms of, of the prices. The sellers still have the 2020 prices in their head and uh, the buyers know they cannot buy at these prices anymore because cost of financing have increased substantially. So that is a bit of a problem in Europe, which on the other hand, talking to potential investors down here, 
gives them nice opportunities because if you're cash rich and you can go all equity on a nice asset, but that gives you a strategic advantage because speed is an advantage. And th those that is that is that is a that is a pretty interesting situation um, right now. And we are trying to basically build that bridge between the US and Europe on the one hand and GCC on the other hand. And um, as of now, it turns out to um, to be successful. Yeah. Let, let me ask you, for, so, for someone watching this business, I mean, not watching this business, watching this video, wondering if they're a potential client or can benefit from you, what is the key factor or the key demographic that should pick up the phone or pick up the WhatsApp and call Holger? What, what, what's, what's their trigger? They want X or they are Y. Well, my typical client is someone who wants this shit go away, who wants who wants to deal done. Yeah. Okay. I think I think um, the key selling point is getting getting a team of advisors that is much more focused on the economics and feasibility of things and the way how they are implemented in just getting theoretical advice. You know, I give you a practical example. If you're looking at a legal problem, and there's many, many lawyers in particular in Germany who love looking at legal problems and tell the clients a lot about this, writing lengthy memos and all that type of stuff. Our take is, if you're not able to attach a price tag to a problem, well, it typically is not really a problem. So let's find a workaround that makes everyone happy and let's get that out of the way. Um, it's it's the way on how we do business. Um, the whole team I have developed over the last years um, works in that way. Um, the good thing about my company and the professionals I have on board in my network, on my platform, is that I know many of them for almost 20 years. They know what they need. They know what the clients want and need. And um, uh, in particular, if you have um, a business that wants to internationalize, that wants to open subsidiaries mm -hmm. all over the world, like in the US, like in Brazil, in England, in Poland, in Malta, in whatever, um, that network of people is, is extremely powerful in doing these things. If it is about fundraising, if it's a venture company, or it's, if it's a private equity fund who wants to do a sale or an acquisition, that those are the typical clients we really feel comfortable with, and those are typically the clients that approach us. And you can do the you can do the most for them. It sounds like. Yeah. Point being, you know, I'm in that business for 25 years, so there's hardly a private equity manager on a higher level in the hierarchy. In, 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 in Europe or the US, I don't know. And um, I'm, I'm actually not doing a lot of, how shall I say, origination work, marketing, okay? Well, actually, I, I it, it you took me, to no, you don't have to. It took me more than a year to even build my homepage because I'm not doing acquisitions of my clients via homepage. Well, now I have one, hello, but <laughs> yeah. just for a week now. But um, it's kind of, uh, it's, it's a lot of referral business. It's mouth propaganda, as we say in German, Mund propaganda, right? So oh, yeah. you propaganda. do a good job. Okay. I know it's what. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, if you do a good job and people like what you're doing, they recommend you to others and they simply call you. And that's basically how it works. And um, there's a lot of clients or, or customers, uh, I would meanwhile even call them because it's really, uh, that way, um, whom I know for so many years, and they 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 uh, come to us on a recurrent basis, and uh, sometimes do the one and sometimes do the other type of business with us. So that is, got yeah. it, perfect. I you know what this is what I wanted. I wanted the fast, hard hitting interview where we get a sense of who you are, your background, what you've worked on, what you are working on, and who can benefit from connecting with you. So Olga, I want, I want to thank you very much for taking the time. I know you're busy. I know you got a family. I know you're running around, but you know, it's, it's great that you're doing this. Uh, I'm glad you hooked up with our Abrahamic business circle. And I think that oh, yes. you can get the word out about what you're doing. But I missed you on that occasion. 
You haven't been there, right? You, you know what? You see that big screen? Actually, you see that big screen behind me? Yeah. That's worth a few yeah. thousand dollars. They were supposed to deliver it in the morning. And the next thing I knew is eight o'clock at night. And I didn't dare leave. So it's it's, <laughs> it's the worst excuse possible. But that that's my stand-up Samsung draw screen. So next time you'll see in the background, you see some cool graphics. Uh, what, what can I say? I, I need a personal assistant to sit here and, and collect my Amazon boxes. Oh, I'm yeah. Just, oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, well, I, I'm getting there. But yeah, I'm sorry I missed ABC this year. But I'll, I'll see you next time. But maybe I did my job of hooking you up with Rafael Nagel and that group, and maybe that maybe that's what was supposed to happen this year. So you yep. never know. Great, great, great guy. Very successful guy. Great organization they have built. Yes, actually. So um, yeah, it's thanks really for the cool. introduction, and thanks for having me here. Yes, my pleasure. All right, I'm gonna stop the recording. Thank you. Good job. One second.